All right, good afternoon, everyone. We want to thank you very much for uh, tuning in today to uh, hear uh, about our voting rights for people experiencing homelessness during COVID-19, during the COVID-19 crisis webinar. Uh, we have an exciting uh, and well-informed, diverse array of perspectives that'll be represented on this call today. And our goal is that you all walk away with a, a firm sense of how you can uh, help register, help to assist people who are experiencing homelessness uh, to vote, but also just for everyone, have, have a better uh, sense of how you can uh, exercise your, your own civic duty uh, of voting. And, and, and so that's, that's our goal today. So to, as, as to uh, today on the call, you see our, our panelists here. Uh, we have, uh, we'll start off, we'll have uh, Megan uh, Hostings, Associate Director of the National Coalition for the, uh, for the Homeless uh, speaking. And then we will lead in with the, the, Natasha Shabera, a legal fellow with the Voting Rights Project. Uh, we also have uh, Russell Hollis, who's the direct, Deputy Director of the Marion County, uh, Indiana Clerk's Office, who will talk about uh, uh, his experience working at the polls and things that uh, people can look for uh, coming up on November 3rd. And then we also are joined by Ira Levy, who's a senior partner with uh, Goodwin and Proctor and also uh, represents, uh, Goodwin is one of our lead members uh, for the National Homelessness Law Center. But before we get into the, the, the content uh, for today, we have some house cleaning uh, content that we need to get to is uh, you'll, you'll see a uh, box that will pop you up on, on your screen where you can participate and submit questions, uh, text questions, comments to to the the uh, panelists. And we have until 3.30 and we'll do the best that we can to uh, answer the questions that you may have. Uh, today, also today's presentation is being recorded. Uh, and will be posted uh, as a resource on our website. So please be aware uh, of that and let's get started. So the, I'd like to you know, call your attention to the three letters on the screen, right, uh, of why. Like why are we discussing voting rights for people who are experiencing homelessness during the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, questions may run to your mind as if, if I didn't have a home, if I didn't know where I was gonna go, I didn't have the basic necessities of life uh, and to sustain life, voting would be the last thing that's on my mind. Uh, Exercising a civic duty seemed like it would come not just second, but way down the line list of things that we would do. And you would be you would be right about that to some extent. But our goal today is to reinforce and, and let the audience know, right, that people experiencing homelessness are just that. They are people and more specifically, they are citizens. And as citizens, they have rights. They have the right to vote, and they have the right to express their political will uh, about the issues and the and the challenges and the things that matter most to them. And so we do that primarily through voting. And so it's important for all of us to uh, ensure that, as people and as uh, uh, citizens, that they that they uh, have this right protected, and that they're well informed so they can go out and uh, exercise their right. But we, we, we cannot uh, you know, divorce it from, from the realities that we're existing in presently, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, clearly, COVID-19 has created an economic fallout uh, that has uh, been catastrophic, but it also has enhanced you know, housing insecurity. Uh, it has shined a, a spotlight and a highlight on just how big of a crisis that uh, homelessness in the United States really has been for some time now. But with COVID, it's exasperated, it's shined a light on it, uh, on the matter, and uh, it's called attention to 
uh, all of us that we we need to do something to address this crisis. Uh, the number of people at risk of eviction between now and some of the earliest registration deadlines of October 5th are very high. Uh, as you see on the screen, that the National Housing Law Project estimates you know 20 to 28 million renters uh, are currently at risk of eviction by the end of this month, which is about a week away. Uh, without some uh, additional intervention from the federal government. Uh, are 28, even if that is the case, uh, if 20, imagine that 28 million people are evicted, right? Maybe 10 million of them will end up on the streets. But even so, uh, that's 10 million additional people in addition to those who are already experiencing homelessness that could be out on the streets uh, very shortly. And so that is the reality that we're currently in. And th these individuals, because they're at risk of eviction, will probably have a lot of questions about their voter registration, what barriers they may face if they do not have a home to voting. And so some of those are the barriers that we're going to address. Uh, so as I said before, there, we have powerful perspectives. We have national legal advocate, advocates who can discuss uh, some of the legal challenges that, that, of voting by mail. We have uh, the National Coalition of the Homeless, or for, excuse me, for the homeless, who will discuss uh, their work and how how we can approach helping uh, people to register to vote. Uh, we have a uh, representative of a major law firm who can discuss ways that uh, big law attorneys can participate pro bono and, and, and really uh, help advance this cause. Uh, we have a local election official who can describe realities on the ground at polling sites. And uh, we, we did have another panelist that was going to join us uh, to, to talk about their, his experience. But uh, if, if he does join later, he'll get a chance to talk about uh, his experience of voting while experiencing homelessness. And we thought that was very valuable for you all to hear. Uh, so without further ado, I will shut my mouth now and pass the, the microphone and the spotlight on to uh, uh, Megan Hustings from the National Coalition for the Homeless. David, are you with? Are you with us? Hello. Hello. Is this? Oh, is this Mr. Davis? This is Mr. Davis. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know you was on the lot. Go. Do you mind going now and 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 talking and sharing your experiences? Uh, give me just a second. I had. Okay. Um, I, I can go ahead now. Uh, sorry, I was, okay, I was okay. taking a minute for my okay. computer to load screen. Okay, fine. Can you hear me all? Go for it, James. Yes. Uh, yes. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I had some technical difficulties, of course. Um, but I'm here, and I'm glad that you all are here. So what's very important um, when it comes to voting is that your vote counts. But before I get into that, I'm just going to mention to you that I experienced homelessness some years ago. And I didn't really have a problem when it came to, like, voting because I had used my housing address in Maryland. So, you know, I would go there during election time and I would vote at the precinct there in southern Maryland. So I never really had a problem, but I knew that they were people who were experiencing homelessness who didn't have an address. And they were having issues trying to register to vote. There were people who were ex-felons coming out of prison. They were having issues with um, trying to cast their vote. Where now in D.C., you don't have to have an address to vote. You can even be uh, incarcerated as a felon and still have the right to vote, which I didn't know until recently. And because I didn't know it, and a lot of people who go out and register people to vote, people experiencing homelessness and what have you, 
they go out and they volunteer and have these people come up to get registered to vote. They didn't even know it. So you can imagine how many people in the homeless community didn't know it. So, like I said, um, going back during the time that I was experiencing homelessness, um, I had been working with the federal government and I was getting close to retiring and I got a divorce and that's when I started to enter into homelessness. At that particular time, I didn't know that I was homeless. I, it wasn't like homeless denial, but it was just a crisis I was going through. And um, once the divorce came through, I left the house and I went to Baltimore, stayed with my brother and told him that you know, um, right now um, I'm unemployed. I took a leave of my absence, but I ended up just retiring. And, um, you know, I would try to find some employment. It wouldn't take me that long to find employment. And, you know, it took, you know, one month turned to two and two months turned to three. And it was at the point where I felt like, you know, my brother is not his place to, you know, to raise me. He was raising a family of his own. He never told me that, but my depression that I was going through, suffering at the time, escalated because of my um, going through a divorce and other issues, you know, that was going on in my life at the time. So it told me that it was time for me to go. And then I came to Washington, D.C., hoping I would have a place to stay with a distant relative, but that didn't quite work out. And I ended up at um, Union Station, you know, where the Amtrak train station comes through. And after a while, they found out that I didn't have a train ticket. I was going anywhere. I was just using the place to sleep like other homeless folks did. So I would get thrown out in the middle of the night. Then I would go down to the Greyhound bus station a couple blocks away, and they found out I wasn't catching the bus either after a while. So the most break of dawns, I was walking downtown Washington, D.C., you know, waiting for daylight so I can go and find a place to you know, to wash up and start looking for some type of employment um, or get some breakfast or get something to eat. Because I had had some savings at the time. So, you know, um, I did consider myself homeless at the time, like I said, so I was just going through a crisis. But as time went on, I found out that the housing cost in D.C. was un, un phenomenal. Um, you know, we're at the point where the job that I was looking for, I would be able to afford it. But at that time, um, those jobs weren't available because there was a freeze, a government freeze. And like I said, I had in the, in the process of retiring from the federal government at that time. So I was waiting on paperwork. So in the meantime, I was staying, I ended up staying in the shelter. To make a long story short, I ended up staying at the Central Union Mission Shelter. And I noticed that during voting time that a lot of residents didn't vote. It wasn't like, you know, somebody would, you know, come in a shelter or leave out the shelter and say, hey, I'm going to vote today. Maybe one or two people out of maybe the 80 residents that were there, because it was a faith-based shelter that I stayed in that was only a, um, like 80 beds there. And um, so I, I started to think, you know, um, is this a problem with people um, being homeless, not being able to vote? And a, a couple of years after that, well, a couple of months after that, I joined um, the National Coalition for the Homeless. And one of their goals was to get people experiencing homelessness to register to vote because they didn't have an address. And um, I know we worked on that for a while, and it actually got to a point where there were other organizations in the area that was also working on the same issue. So eventually, in D.C., you didn't have to have um, you know, ID. Only thing you had to do was demonstrate that you had a minimum length of residency in order to register and that you live in the district and you don't claim voting residence anywhere else in the U.S. or its territory. So um, not having an address was a huge barrier, you know. It um, just felt like folks were just disconnected from the process just because they were experiencing homelessness at that particular time, whereas they probably voted all their lives. And then now it seemed like it was kind of a voter suppression type thing, you know, to make them feel like you're not part of, you know, the American dream or, you know, you're not a citizen because you don't have a vote. 
It's not that they took away your right to vote. It's that they made it almost hard for you to vote because you couldn't prove that you had an address. Even if the address that you had was at a church that you stayed at or you were receiving services from, that still wasn't good enough because that really wasn't where you lived in the city. Um, you could be in Ward 7 and go to Ward 3 at a church and downtown breakfast program or lunch program or get your mail there, but you didn't reside in that particular ward. You lived on the other side of the city. So there were obstacles and barriers people had to overcome um, just for the right to vote because they were homeless. And um, so now we have Section 7 of the National Voter Registration Act. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but that encourages non-governmental entities to serve as voter registration um, agencies including homeless shelters now, drop-in shelters like the D.C. Downtown Day Service Center on New York Avenue. So um, people experiencing homelessness who wish to seek aid or already um, seek aid from the center, um, the whole downtown homeless center, they can register there to vote in D.C. and use that center as an address, whereas before this wasn't um, something that, you know, that they could do. So now, you know, people have that right to vote, especially during this election cycle, which everybody says is a very, very important election cycle. And most of them are, you know, because issues pertain to us. And especially with COVID-19 going on, we need to um, make certain that those people have that right. So I want to thank you guys, and I'm quite sure we have time for questions at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Davis, for, for sharing your experience. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. And uh, just before we move on to Megan to touch on something important that you, you discussed, right, is, is that people didn't know, right? People didn't know that they had this right. And yeah. uh, webinars like this uh, and, and are, are, are important for that very reason. We want to spread awareness and uh, clarify miscommunication about about voting and who can and who can't so we want to thank you for for sharing that and i'm sure people will have questions in the end so with that being said uh megan you can take it away okay uh so i'm, I'm assuming everyone can hear me now yes yes yeah. <laughs> okay great i figured out finally how to unmute myself um, so uh, with the national coalition for the homeless uh, uh as is james we are a national advocacy organization. We've been around since the early 1980s. Uh, and it was actually in 1992, uh, the first election that we um, ran the You Don't Need a Home to Vote campaign. Uh, this is a, a project uh, that came along with, with several other projects that actually around the same time that were really all about protecting the civil rights of people who are currently experiencing homelessness. So just a snippet, hopefully, of, of history that um, you know, it was really the, the late 70s, early 80s that we started to see an explosion of homelessness. The late 80s, we got the uh, original Homeless Assistance Act, now known as the McKinney-Vento Act, passed. So there was uh, money coming in. There were homeless services that were being funded, shelters and, and this sort of thing. So um, that's why it was about the 90s to really try to focus on protecting the civil rights of people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so, uh, let's see, there we go. Um, so I just wanted to go through some of the um, some of the, what the project has done over the years is uh, work with states to actually ensure that that the folks who do not have a permanent address a home address could uh, register and to and cast their ballot across the country. So now um, there are mo most states will allow you to use if not a shelter then um, perhaps the location where you're staying if it's outdoors. Uh, uh, you know, the cross streets or um, even if it's it's under a an overpass or something as well, if you can describe where it is or sometimes in some states even draw uh, a map of, of the location where you sleep, that, that will be used to uh, figure out your precinct where you can vote. So um, while there are efforts and while many, many states have um, taken the effort to ensure that their registration guidelines and voting guidelines include people without a permanent address, there's still a lot of barriers. So that's kind of what I wanted to go Megan. Hold on, Megan. Right can, can we get... Mr. Davis? Yes. Uh, yes. Can you hit, hit mute? All right, thank you. 
Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that James, um, he does a lot of work with Street Sense uh, and yeah, he's yeah. The, the street newspaper. <laughs> um, so uh, I just wanted to go briefly through some of the, the barriers, kind of the, the classic set of barriers that um, people experiencing homelessness, low income folks as well um, experience. Um, it, it's been well documented in a number of studies um, over the years uh, that folks who have lower incomes vote at, at lower rates than those with higher incomes. Uh, so, you know, of course, there's there's many different reasons why we do this work, but um, one, because, you know, someone who, who doesn't have a home, that doesn't mean you lose your, your civil rights, your basic um, rights guaranteed by the Constitution. So um, lack of ID is a huge thing, uh, even though many of our resources require a government-issued ID. When you're homeless, um, when you're in a shelter, when you're staying outdoors, it's very easy to lose your ID. Uh, to not be able to uh, replace it. Um, folks who have uh, stayed outside, sometimes in shelters, you, you might have your bag stolen, you, you have your, um, your uh, campsite kind of raided or, or swept, cleaned out, uh, and all your personal papers, all of your personal items just kind of thrown out. Once you lose your ID, especially if you don't have access to your social security card um, and or birth certificate, it's a it's a very long process. It's very difficult to get that replaced. It's not necessarily always um, uh, an issue of cost either. Just that the process is so arduous. Uh, so there, there's lots of barriers for someone who's surviving on a daily basis to try to access, you know, the um, the process for getting an ID replaced. It's huge. Um, you know, keeping your registration current, making sure that when you move addresses. Uh, that you've updated your registration. This is why we encourage organizations, shelters, and other, other service programs to include voter registration as a part of their intake process so that every time you work with someone, you're making sure that their registration is current um, to the best of your ability. Uh, there's, there's problems here too because, um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, as we're, we're seeing with uh, the COVID, with the pandemic, there's a lot of organizations that are either um, closing in some cases, unfortunately, or um, closing their doors, meaning um, folks who were for, maybe not be um, staying at a shelter, but were still getting their mail to, um, at, a, at a certain shelter, aren't able to get in to pick up their mail anymore. So this has been um, a barrier that we've seen, uh, especially now that there are many more states that are encouraging or um, even mandating mail-in ballots. Um, or just period, you know, if you don't have your uh, ID, sometimes you can use a voter registration card, but if that's been mailed to an address that you're not able to pick up mail, again, another huge barrier to, to actually ask, accessing your, um, your ballot, your vote. Um, we see that there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding or just lack of understanding of what state statutes are around voting without an address. Um, not all election officials are fully trained on um, on those exact regulations from from the state, and then of course, just um, James mentioned, Carlton mentioned, surviving on a daily basis when you've lost your home, when you don't have ready access to um, hygiene facilities or food or or shelter, um, it's difficult just to to kind of keep your eyes focused on daily survival. Um, so voting and and feeling like your vote matters are a whole nother it's a whole nother step beyond that. Um, that you know, rightly so, not everybody has the capacity for. So, um, you know, a lot of the barriers to to casting your ballot are similar to registration. Um, just that your registration is not current. You know, you got to go to the wrong polling place. The election officials don't know what the process is for um, uh, for submitting a provisional ballot, or uh, again, for understanding where you vote when you don't have an address, or even if you've forgotten where you're getting your mail. Um, you know, all, all these things that have to do with registration and not being um, current. Of course, disengagement, like I said before, um, when, you're, when you're just trying to survive on a daily basis. We're also seeing, unfortunately, this year, along with the agency closures and the stress that that's putting on people um, accessing their mail, um, there's a lot of um, just ongoing voter suppression um, efforts, uh, everything from polling places being limited you know, in some part that's due to safety around COVID, which is understandable. However, uh, when you reduce the number of polling locations, you 
reduce the access to to vote for someone who might not have uh, not, not, might not be able to vote by mail again might not be receiving their mail or can't um, otherwise access uh, their vote you know we need we need to make sure that anyone with any abilities uh, can act to, can vote you know can cast their ballot it's a it's a basic civil right um, that we all should be able to access so there's a lot of different methods of, of suppression going on but there's also a lot of misinformation out there too we've heard reports of um, websites or, or people saying you know just go to this we website to vote or go to this website to um, to check on your registration and th there's some of these that um, that, uh, that are malicious or you know aren't providing actually the information that they're supposed to we have a, a large number of um, organizations of, of websites that are providing the correct information thankfully um, but it's really going to take everyone working together to share that information. Um, someone on their own might just catch the wrong information. And, and there's a lot of folks, a lot of bad actors out there actually trying to spread misinformation to prevent people from, uh, from voting in the proper way. Um, so, uh, you know, as far as uh, our You Don't Need a Home to Vote campaign, um, these are the things that we suggest that you do. Uh, everyone, um, whether you have a home or not, whether you've voted before or not, whether you've registered before or not, just check your registration. It's very easy to do. It's very quick. Um, the the websites, as I suggest, um, you can go to our website, nationalhomeless.org, uh, and our voting pages, there's a, a button on the right side where, you, uh, where we have a, a secure portal for checking your uh, voter registration, and you can find your polling place, get information about your candidates, all of that stuff, um, but there's others. Vote.org uh, is a, another one. Vote 411. Um, I'm sure Carlton um, and the others will be sharing some uh, a, a list of websites later on. Uh, nonprofit Vote. These are all uh, respected, you know, great places to check your registration. Uh, we also really encourage you all to um, know your rights and, and know what your state's regulations are around address. Uh, for registration and for voting. Uh, we'll talk about it later in this presentation, some uh, Know Your Rights cards that we're working on that hopefully will be live on um, our website, nationalhomeless.org, uh, uh, any day now, <laughs> hopefully by the end of the week. Uh, and uh, the, we also have in, our, in the manual that we do every year, the kind of toolkit around uh, voting that we do, we have a, a, a matrix of state uh, election uh, regulations, uh, so you can look up there. You can also find the link to your state board of education uh, of elections, where you can find the specific and, and up to date information too about your your state's uh, guidelines. This is also a, um, a great time to locate your polling places, kind of understand what the polling situation is in your community. You know whether there are polling locations that have closed. Um, you know whether there are additional ways that people can access their their ballot if, it, if there's mail-in ballots they're encouraged there's a, a wonderful um website i will um i forget the exact name but i'll share it in, in the um in the chat a little bit later on that shows um really well state by state mail-in ballot procedures um and and guidelines so, since we all know that there's a lot more of that um again organizations uh include registration as part of your intake there, there's a lot of organizations who are doing fantastic work i know that um, yesterday was uh, the National Voter Registration Day, and there was a lot of events happening then. But uh, we also know that there's a, a lot of work to not only uh, register folks, but to get out the vote as well. Um, it's going to look a little bit different this year with COVID um, because there are so many, so much of a, fo so there's so much of a focus on um, mail-in ballots, on um, you know doing the. Uh, uh, casting votes in a non-congregate setting, which is fabulous. Um, Again, but we, we need to make sure that uh, casting your ballot, that voting is accessible to everyone, no matter their abilities or, um, or their capacity, really. So um, that's kind of the top level. I'm happy to answer more questions. Um, please remember that you can um, look up all of our toolkit. We have social media, um, uh, images like this one or other um, you know, examples of, of posts that you can use on social media to, to build awareness, um, to get a vote, and I'm happy to, to answer questions. You have my contact information. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, guys.
Thank you, Megan. And you see here, again, reiterating the message, you don't need a home to vote. Don't need a home to vote. So uh, next, we will have uh, Natasha Sh uh, Shabria. Uh, she will be, uh, she's a legal fellow with the Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. As Natasha will talk about that project and also some of the legal issues around uh, that may be circulating about voting by mail. Yeah, um, can you all hear me? Wonderful. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Natasha Chabria. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a legal fellow with the Voting Rights Project of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for inviting me to speak at this panel. Um, it's truly a privilege to be amongst such fierce advocates. Um, so I think we can move on to the next slide, please, and I can get started with the presentation. So just going to give a quick overview of who we are. There's amazing, fabulous organizations around the country that are doing all this work. Um, Lawyers Committee is a small part of that work. Um, so the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law uh, was founded in, in 1965 at the request of President John F. Kennedy. So kind of at the height of the civil rights movement, um, he requested uh, members of the private bar to come together to really work with civil rights leaders to ensure um, that civil rights issues were addressed um, and that we were mobilizing members of the private bar to work with civil rights leaders. Um, so our organization is primarily a racial justice organization. So everything that we do is really focused on that lens and ensuring that communities of color are able to access their fundamental rights. Um, Voting rights is kind of one of the flagship issues of our organization, but it's kind of expanded over the years because we recognize that civil rights and people's lives are multifaceted. Um, so the only way to really do this work is to engage from all fronts. Um, so just, I, I've listed kind of some of the project areas that we have, including voting rights. We also work on criminal justice, um, educational opportunities, economic justice, which includes uh, workers' rights and also health equity, um, special litigation and advocacy. They kind of work on anything you can think of under the sun. So right now they're working on issues um, related to protecting protesters' rights, environmental justice issues, immigration issues, um, and so on. We also have the James Byrd Jr. Center to Stop Hate. Um, they're an incredible project that really works on um, opposing and preventing hate crimes, as well as educating the public about hate crimes across the country. Um, we have our Fair Housing and Community Development Project, um, that really focuses on access to e equitable housing. Um, and finally, we have our public policy project, which kind of supports all of us, as well as engages in initiatives around judicial nominations um, and other issues such as that. Um, next slide, please. So kind of gonna zoom in now on the voting rights project, which is what we're, what we're here to talk about today. Um, so as others have mentioned, our goal is really to ensure that every eligible voter can cast a ballot that counts. Um, so we want you to get to the polls, but we also want your voice to matter and to be taken into account um, as we deal with these really, really contentious issues. Um, we take a multi-pronged approach to addressing voter suppression because we understand that it's not just it's not just a single issue fight. Um, and I think a webinar like this really kind of highlights the fact that we need to attack everything from multiple fronts. Um, so one prong of the work we do is litigation. Um, so I'm an attorney with the project. We do long-term impact litigation where we identify issues um, with voting rights and kind of litigate them through the courts to ensure that laws are either interpreted to be expansive in allowing everyone to access their right to vote, um, or that laws that is effectively um, suppress the vote are changed. Um, we also do emergency rapid response, which I'll kind of get into a little bit more later when I talk about our election protection program. Um, but essentially, uh, we respond on election day to any issues that arise um, that require immediate emergency attention from the courts. Um, the second prong is our election protection program. Um, so this is to me kind of the crown jewel of what we do because it involves engaging local communities and local partners. Um, it's really hard to do litigation work in a vacuum if you don't understand what people on the ground are actually going through and what their needs are. Um, so through that, we run our 866 Our Vote hotline um, which I'll kind of talk about a little bit more in detail in a moment. Um, and through our hotline, we receive thousands and thousands of calls um, daily and throughout the year from voters like yourselves, um, addressing issues from finding your polling place to um, kind of more serious fundamental challenges. Um, we also work with groups across the country 
in over 30 states to do field work. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide, please. So what is election protection? Um, we are the nation's oldest and largest nonpartisan election protection coalition. Um, so the key word to that is nonpartisan. You'll probably see a lot of efforts from various political parties doing election protection work, which is incredibly important. Um, but because we are nonpartisan, we really believe in helping all voters, regardless of what your political affiliation is. Um, so we recruit and mobilize thousands and thousands of grassroots and legal volunteers across 30 states. Um, the picture on the side you'll see is last year <laughs> and up until March when we used to do in-person call centers, but now things have changed because of COVID. Um, so we now kind of operate uh, remotely for everyone's safety. Um, so our volunteers essentially are, are working on two fronts. One, we train and recruit legal volunteers to answer our hotline. Um, so if you call into our hotline, um, you will be paired up with a trained legal professional who can answer your questions. As I mentioned, it could be anything from finding your polling place, making sure your registration is up to date, um, getting you in touch with your county clerk to ask a specific question, um, reporting voter intimidation at the polls, um, so on and so forth. Um, so our election protection hotline, as I mentioned, the number is 866-R-VOTE. We've been in operation since 2000, um, since the 2000 election, and we've only continued to grow and expand our program since then. Um, we engage with partners who are doing state and local work, as well as national advocacy organizations to kind of hit it at all fronts. Um, so at the national coalition level, we have several working groups who are working on various issues of voter protection. Um, for example, um, I believe Megan and others mentioned um, misinformation and disinformation. So we have a group of national advocates who are specifically working on strategizing around how to combat that. Um, we also have folks working on legal strategies so that when issues do arise, we're kind of ready to go. Um, uh, partnering with that, we have grassroots volunteers. So these are folks who are in the field day of um, really working with voters to make sure that we address any issues of voter suppression or intimidation as they arise. Um, so in the past, we've had folks monitoring outside polling sites um, so that if, let's say, we see long lines at a polling place, we can then work with our contacts at local elections offices to try to figure out a solution. Um, or, for example, you know, in the past, we've seen or we've received reports of polling locations that maybe don't have correct signage or don't have the appropriately translated materials or uh, maybe machines are down or they don't have it's not accessible for folks with physical disabilities or folks who require additional assistance um, for, um, let's say, folks who are blind or deaf or hard of hearing, things like that. Um, the next prong of our election protection program is voter education. Um, so we create every year and constantly update a series of voter education materials. Um, we have a list of FAQs on our website, which will be, um, I'll talk about momentarily, that we're updating constantly. Um, so that's everything. Any question you may have about voting from issues like, what do I do if I don't have a permanent address, to what are the different options I have for casting my ballot? Um, and especially given COVID and all of the changes we've seen across um, both state, local, um, and uh, federal, federally around various different voting related practices. And um, we're trying to really keep up to date on what the new practices are. Um, so if you see something on the website that may be a little bit out of date, don't worry, it's being updated as we speak. Um, we also engage in poll worker recruitment, particularly with an emphasis on that this year, given the fact that um, due to COVID, many, many folks who have been poll workers in the past um, are unable to volunteer in that capacity given various concerns. Um, so we've partnered with other organizations as well as pro bono law firms to create a set of poll worker guides um, that you can also find on our law, uh, on our website um, that kind of outlines how to become a poll worker in each of our priority states, as well as what it kind of looks like to be a poll worker on the ground. And finally, as I mentioned, we do litigation when and where necessary. So on election day, prior to election day, and post-election day, we're receiving calls. Um, so if folks call and, and we see an issue that requires immediate attention that can't be resolved through advocacy or um, just talking with the local poll workers or clerks, um, we will engage in rapid response um, emergency litigation. So oftentimes that looks like just trying to extend polling hours um, or trying to, trying to just 
reopen a polling place that got closed. Um, so for example, in uh, in Tennessee, in the primaries back in, I believe it was March, feels like a lifetime ago now, um, they, they had a natural disaster hit there. Um, and due to that, a lot of the polling locations were closed early. Um, however, voting hours weren't extended. Um, so we went to court to try to extend polling hours so that folks could vote despite the fact um, that there was a natural disaster. So things like that are often um, the sorts of emergency work that we engage in. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is kind of some of the resources that I was talking about in the previous slide. Um, so our biggest resource is our hotline. Um, so I know here it says it's open 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time, Monday through Friday. But actually, just before we got on this webinar, um, I received updated information from my colleagues who um, staff and run the hotline that due to the fact that we're receiving such overwhelming, um, we're receiving such an overwhelming number of calls to our hotline, particularly as we enter the early voting season for the general election, we've expanded the hours that we're open. Um, so now the hotline is going to be live from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time every single day, a Monday through Friday with limited hours on the weekends. Um, then as we get closer and closer to election day, it's essentially going to be running 24 hours a day. Um, if someone does not pick up your call, um, it will go to our voicemail system and someone and a trained legal volunteer will return your call as soon as possible. Um, we really try to be um, exceptionally responsive because we understand that um, there are many issues that could arise with voting and we want as many people to be able to access the franchise as possible. Um, so I included our number down there. The, the fun tagline is 866-R-VOTE, um, but the actual number is 866-687-8683. Um, so I will mention that this is our English language hotline. Um, it's the biggest hotline that we have, but we also work with other partners um, to run a few national, uh, a few, na sorry, excuse me, a few language access hotlines. So we have a uh, an Arabic hotline, um, Asian languages hotline, and a Spanish language hotline. Um, if you are a native voter in Arizona, our partners also run a native vote hotline specific to native communities in Arizona. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we really try to keep up to date with the resources on our website and we're constantly adding new ones in, ad in addition to working with new partners to ensure that everyone has access to this information. Um, so I've included the link to our 866rvote.org website. So there you'll find everything from the FAQs I mentioned to voting laws in your state, um, how to request your absentee ballot, how to register to vote, um, any question you may have. Specifically to folks who are trying to register who don't have a permanent address, we also have a resource that kind of similar to what Megan mentioned, um, breaks down the various requirements for each state. Um, and it's really, really important to make sure you check what the requirement in your state is because there's no one blanket rule. Um, so for example, in Alaska, you can use a PO box um, or, a, or a permanent address. Um, in Maryland, you can use the address of a, of a shelter or of a religious institution. But regardless of what it is, you need to make sure that they're willing to accept your mail. Um, because if that's not the case, then it's, it's not effective. Um, the other important thing to check is there's some states that allow you to just put cross streets um, where you do reside most of the time. Um, but that's not every state. So again, make sure to check um, what the appropriate requirements are for your state. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the second prong of what we do is litigation. Um, and a lot of our litigation calls that we receive to our hotline. Um, so oftentimes, we will engage in emergency litigation kind of day of on things that need rapid response. but other times we'll see trends that we can't necessarily address day of, but that we can then go and do advocacy around, or if it comes to litigation around, um, kind of moving into the future past election day. Um, so prior to election day this year, particularly in, particularly in response to all the challenges that have arisen from COVID-19, um, we've been engaging in a lot of proactive litigation. Um, so here are just some of the topics that we've been getting around. Um, since March at this point. Um, and for context, we've, I believe, filed 
about 25 lawsuits since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, mostly around access to absentee voting. Um, so as we're looking to increase the need for absentee voting, we want to make sure that everyone has access to this. So one of the things that we've really been looking at are states that have strict excuse requirements. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, no. oh, sorry. Can we, can we get the mute? All right, I think we're good. We're good to go. We can hear you. Okay, great. Now. great. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, and as Megan mentioned as well, because of COVID-19, there's been an increased push for folks to vote absentee, um, either early in person or via mail. Um, so in anticipation of that, we've been doing a lot of work, a lot of advocacy, as well as litigation um, around making sure that absentee voting schemes are as accessible as possible. Um, so for example, in some states, they have very strict, strict excuse requirements, meaning that you can only vote absentee by mail if you fit a certain uh, excuse. So some states have been um, proactive in interpreting that kind of broadly um, looking towards challenges raised by COVID-19. So some states have said, um, okay, we'll kind of just create a blanket exception that anyone who is self-isolating or um, has concerns about their health is able to just request an absentee ballot. Some states are just sending absentee ballot request forms to all registered voters. Other states, we've had to do a little bit more advocacy to get that broad interpretation. Um, so for example, Kentucky was one of those states. Um, we engaged in litigation with them earlier this summer and were able to come to a um, positive resolution with the Secretary of State, essentially allowing, um, essentially construing that anyone um, who was concerned about their safety and their health uh, when voting in person would be able to request an absentee ballot. Um, they're going to, broad, and similar with Louisiana, they're going to broadly interpret um, their disability or illness excuse to include anyone who is worried about their health due to COVID-19. Um, another thing that we've really been looking at are witness requirements. So some states um, will require you to obtain the signature of a witness um, in order to validate your absentee ballot. Um, so, for example, Minnesota is one of the states that required that, but um, voting rights advocates were able to achieve a positive settlement in that regard as well. So what Minnesota is doing now is that anyone who's already a registered voter, when they request their absentee ballot, will just have a sticker across the witness signature line, so you don't have to actually obtain that witness signature. The reason it's problematic is because if you are concerned about your health, if you have to then go and interact with another person, um, to validate your absentee ballot, it, it kind of invalidates the purpose of voting from home and not going into the polling place. Um, we're challenging a similar requirement in Alaska right now, um, where it's particularly dangerous for folks in our native community out there um, who are um, at even heightened, have even heightened concerns of the health impacts. Um, another thing that we've been looking at are ballot receipt and postmark deadlines. Um, so it, Again, that's another thing to really check. Um, it varies state by state. So some states, for example, will count your ballot only if it's received on election day, whereas other states will count it if it's postmarked by election day. Um, so we've been really trying to work with election officials to make sure that um, as more folks are voting by mail, this is as expansive as possible. And finally, another thing that we're looking at are drop boxes. So when folks are voting by mail and voting absentee, we want to give them as many options as possible to return their ballot. Um, so you can return it by mail, you can return it in person at your county clerk's office, um, and some states are allowing folks to return them in drop boxes, which are just centralized locations where you can just go drop it in, kind of like how the library has those um, boxes where you can return books. Um, so in Hawaii, one of the issues we had, and we were actually work working with folks who were advocating for people experiencing homelessness, um, we wanted to ensure that drop boxes were located in places um, where people had access and also that they were open during hours where people who were working or had caregiving duties um, were able to access them. Um, kind of other broad topics that we've been looking at are voter roll purges. So as Megan mentioned, it's really important to make sure your registration is up to date um, and that you are an active voter. Otherwise, oftentimes states will get rid of your name off the list. And if they don't appropriately notify you, you go to vote in person or request your absentee ballot and you're denied. Um, so depending on the state you're in, there's deadlines for re-registering and making sure that you're actually able to cast your vote. Um, 
And so we keep an active eye out to make sure that states are not um, just doing that willy nilly because we want everyone to be able to vote. Um, as Megan mentioned, we also look at polling place closures. Um, we look at early voting locations, again, with an eye to COVID-19 and the fact that um, we are encouraging folks to vote early as much as possible. We wanna make sure that there are accessible locations, both in terms of um, physical location as well as um, accessibility based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, because folks who do have disabilities need to be able to access these locations. We've been doing advocacy around the USPS. Um, as folks have seen, there's been a lot of controversy around um, the Postal Service. And as we're asking folks to vote by mail, we want to ensure that the Postal Service is able to keep up with those demands. Um, and finally, we're um, also uh, ad doing advocacy around the census, which is another critically important tool. Um, next slide, please. All right, so that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, and actually one last thing I did wanna mention and my apologies for uh, forgetting this earlier, um, but with our hotline, not only can you call in, but recently we just launched a new function where you can also text our hotline and a trained volunteer will answer your question. Um, you can direct message us through Facebook or WhatsApp, um, and you can also go on our website and engage in a live chat with one of our volunteers. So lots of ways to get your questions answered. Um, we have lots of people ready to go, so please reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, and thanks again. Thank you, Natasha, for that, for, that, for that great information. And for those of you that have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Lawyers Committee or ask them here uh, while we're on the, on the webinar. We can uh, do what we can to answer those. All right, so the next speaker that we have coming to, uh, to talk to you is Mr. Hollis, uh, Russell Hollis, who will uh, give us some insight about the polls themselves, his work, and what you can, uh, just a local perspective of what folks will see when they're trying to vote. Russell. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Carlton, um, and thank you for our, uh, allowing me to be on this esteemed panel. Um, I'll highlight some of the uh, uh, issues that Megan and Natasha uh, have previously addressed with respect to voter registration. And then I'll jump into what uh, in-person looks like, in-person voting looks like uh, and some of the issues that we commonly see uh, with our homeless voters in Marion County. Uh, so to give you all some background on of who I am and what I do, uh, again, I'm Russell Hollis. I'm the deputy director for the Marion County Clerk's Office in that capacity. I serve as the spokesperson for the Marion County Election Board, and I am the Director of Policy and Communications for both the Clerk's Office and the Election Board. Um, and so I've uh, been in this role since January 2015, and I've uh, this will be my second round of presidential elections in this capacity. So I've seen quite a few things over the past six years or so. Um, with respect to voter registration, um, homeless voters, uh, they can register to vote uh, just as Megan and Natasha outlined earlier, um, in Indiana, uh, people who have a what we call a non-traditional residence, and that's typically those who are homeless or even those who live in a motor home, uh, they must provide a, a location that's sufficient to allow local election officials to place that uh, place that person in a precinct. Um, make that into plain English. Um, what we typically do is that we encourage uh, homeless voters to use the federal voter registration forms. And there is a space to where the homeless voter, if they do not have an address, uh, they can uh, draw a map, uh, like Megan mentioned earlier, and they can uh, draw out like the, the intersections uh, of where they stay, and they can kind of note where on the uh, on the intersection they live, and that helps the county election board um, put them into a precinct, which determines the kind of ballot style that that voter will receive. And by ballot style, I mean that determines who's going to be on their ballot, right? If you live across the street, you might have a different school board candidate or a different city councilor on your ballot. Uh, so that's why it's important for us to have a pretty good idea of where the voter lives so that we can put them in the right precinct. Um, something that James mentioned earlier, uh, 
uh, James mentioned uh, issues with uh, homeless people receiving uh, their mail at homeless shelters or at churches and things of that nature and you know uh, that those places might serve as motor registration sites and I might be getting people mixed up at this point of what uh, y'all talked about but um, with respect to voter registration in Indiana the mailing address for the voter can be a homeless shelter or church um, or other uh, location and so the homeless uh, voter they can get their um, their voter registration card they can get that from one of those shelters uh, or other places it is not necessary to have the uh, the voter registration card but the uh, election mail can be sent uh, to the shelter or church um, a post office box that will not be uh, a sufficient residential address for purposes of establishing uh, the precinct in which the voter must vote. Uh, so that's why it's uh, pretty imperative that the voter uh, uses a, uh, can uh, draw on a map where exactly they live. And I'm not sure if that's Indiana specific, but that's definitely the case here in Indiana. Uh, one thing that uh, has been prevalent in Indiana over the past 10 years is online voter registration. Um, I myself used, uh, I registered to vote online at my current address and it took me maybe 45 seconds to do so. Um, but homeless voters, they are not able to uh, register to vote online if they do not have a uh, residential address. Uh, so that's kind of a barrier uh, to, uh, to our homeless voters and they, and with respect to registering to vote, but there's still that traditional paper option uh, for voter registration for our homeless voters. Um, now with respect to uh, in-person voting, uh, one of the issues that I've uh, seen uh, with my own two eyes at polling places is that uh, homeless voters do have issues with not having an ID. In a, a valid ID, you know, it can be expired from the date of the previous general election. And uh, in Indiana, you know, that date of the previous general election is November 2018. Uh, but in the particular case of the homeless voter, they don't have an ID at all. And so I've actually been there where the voter was about to leave. And I said, wait, <laughs> don't leave you can always vote a provisional ballot. And so if you're not familiar with what a provisional ballot is, and I'm pretty sure everyone on this panel is, but a provisional ballot, I, I kind of define it as something went wrong. So I can still cast a ballot and give the county election board time to research why I did not vote a traditional in-person ballot and give them time to see whether my vote should be counted. And so in the, uh, in the case of a voter who does not have an ID on election day, uh, in Indiana, they have 10 days to provide uh, the county election board with their ID. And so in the case of the, the homeless voter, you know, if they are able to get an ID, then they can uh, just, uh, they can come to the county election board office and they can show staff their ID, we'll make a note of it and that vote will be counted. Uh, but I do know that getting an ID, it's not always easy. And so I have, uh, I've been out to different community group meetings where I've encouraged uh, uh, the, uh, the outreach uh, folks there uh, to, to actually register uh, homeless people to vote and encourage them to vote absentee by mail. And I have not seen any issues with uh, the voters in Marion County, which is Indianapolis, Indiana. I have not seen any issues with uh, our homeless voters in terms of uh, obstacles to voting absentee by mail. The biggest obstacle has been, um, you know, where your mailing address go, uh, but there are various uh, homeless shelters uh, near downtown as well as churches um, uh, outside of downtown uh, where homeless folks have been uh, getting their, uh, their election mail or just their mail in general. 
And when it comes to uh, voting absentee by mail, and I keep voting absentee by mail because that's what we have here in Indiana, which is different than vote by mail. Uh, but with respect to voting absentee by mail, there is an application. Um, and in order to complete the application, you must qualify. Now, in order to qualify, you have to just simply check a box. Um, and there are roughly 11 different reasons that a voter can select uh, for why they want to vote absentee by mail. Uh, some of those reasons include, I am a voter over the age of 65. Um, I do not have sufficient transportation to get to the polling place. Um, I expect to be out of the county on election day, or I am working at a polling place on election day. Uh, so those are just a few examples of how a person could qualify, but from a very practical perspective, uh, gosh, should I even say, it? I'll say it. From a practical perspective, the county election board does not have the capacity to verify why someone chose to vote absentee by mail. Uh, so you just check a box and uh, more than likely you will uh, you will qualify. Uh, Megan, don't come back to get me, or I'm sorry, Natasha, don't, don't make me pay a penalty for saying that. <laughs> um, with uh, voting absentee by mail, you do not need an ID uh, when you vote absentee by mail. One of the uh, reasons why we do encourage our homeless voters to vote absentee by mail, uh, simply because it's just easier uh, for them to do so. And um, I'm going to transition back to in-person voting. Uh, historically, in Indianapolis, Indiana, our in-person early voting locations have been limited. Um, back when um, Carlton, when you lived in Indianapolis, we were limited to only one in-person early voting location uh, in the whole county. That was just the county clerk's office, which is located downtown Indianapolis. And parking near um, the city government building, and we call it the city county building, parking near there was awful. It, it's awful. And so to expect people, whether homeless or not, to just come to that one location drive around for 10, 15 minutes or so in a struggle to find parking or to pay for uh, parking just to vote is just not, not good. Uh, but things have changed for the better. And I'm fortunate to be part of the administration where that change has, ha has occurred. And so as of last year, that was the first year to where um, we've had multiple in-person early voting locations first year since 2008 that we've had multiple in early voting locations for a federal election. Um, I'll be blunt and honest as to why we did not have those in-person early voting locations. It was purely political. Uh, it was a decision. Uh, the state legislature, they actually changed election law that required a unanimous vote from the three member election board. Uh, to approve uh, early voting locations, or we call them early voting satellite locations. And the reason why that happened is because in 2008, uh, there was a, a candidate who ran for president named Barack Obama, who was the first Democrat to win uh, the popular vote in the state of Indiana in a very long time. And so uh, what we saw is one that law was passed that required the unanimous vote of the county election board, you saw that in Indiana, the larger democratic counties, um, they their county election boards would not unanimously pass or unanimously approve uh, early voting locations. And so that did have a negative impact on our homeless voters because they were extremely limited with respect to their ability to vote in person. Uh, they were just limited to downtown. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, things have changed for 2020 uh, for the general election. We will have the most uh, satellite voting locations that we've had in the history of uh, Marion County elections. That's the good news. The bad news is that it's only six locations. So that's not a lot, but <laughs> progress is, is slow. 
uh, for election day, we will have almost 200 locations. Specifically, there will be there will be 187 locations, uh, but we have uh, transitioned to becoming a, a vote center county. Uh, so as a vote center county, our voters, um, and this is uh, easier for our homeless voters as well, but voters can vote at any election day polling place. Um, and so that's one of the advantages, advantages of being a vote center county. Um, the impact that that does have on our homeless voters is that they are not limited to the physical structure that houses their precinct. Now they can vote at any election day polling place, which does include uh, several large facilities. Uh, the NBA has been uh, very adamant on having all of their uh, stadiums become election day polling places, and that is the case in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, Bankers Life Fieldhouse, where the Indiana Pacers play, that will be a polling location. Uh, Lucas Oil Stadium, where the Indianapolis Colts play, that, that will be a polling location as well. And uh, Hinkle Fieldhouse, where Butler University plays their basketball games, that will be a polling location too. Uh, so from a safety perspective, um, we are well positioned to conduct a safe in-person uh, voting experience for our voters uh, this election cycle. Uh, voters just have to take advantages of the in-person early voting opportunities which will occur over a 28 day period beginning Tuesday, October 6th in Indiana, um, or they can take advantage of any of the election day polling locations we have. And finally, I do want to reiterate a note that was made earlier, and that is if you are planning to vote absentee by mail, do not wait to the last minute. Uh, give the post office enough time to get your ballot to you in Indiana, we have an application deadline, and that application deadline is Thursday, October 24th. However, under no circumstances do I, do I recommend someone wait till that application deadline to request uh, to vote by mail. There have been too many uh, news stories uh, of delays with the post office. Do not wait till close to that deadline, which is roughly 10 days or so before election day. Um, I would recommend that voters, uh, uh, particularly our homeless voters, uh, who might have delays in getting uh, getting to the mail that the, the homeless shelter or church has for them, that they go ahead and uh, apply to vote absentee by mail as quickly as possible so that they have plenty of time to get their ballot, complete that ballot as soon as you get it. Um, I'll even go a step further I recommend that all of our voters um, check their ballots to make sure that uh, in Indiana, you know, you have to have uh, bipartisan initials of election officials on the back of your ballot. So make sure that uh, that those initials are on the back of the ballot um, and make sure that you have the correct ballot. Um, and the reason why I highlight those things is because I do know from a practical perspective, once the counties begin to get bombarded by um, election mail, there will be mistakes because a lot of the processes with respect to uh, absentee voting are archaic. Uh, they're, all, uh, they're all codified processes, but they're archaic because our election laws and our election structure uh, if I can use that term, they're built for mostly in-person voting. And 2020 is kind of exposing that and revealing that, and it's creating challenges because one year is not enough time for counties to transition from mostly in-person voting to mostly voting by mail. And so because everything is a manual process where you have people looking at sheets of paper and they're using pens to you know initial the back of a ballot there is a pop there's just too much room for error uh for clerical errors so i do encourage voters to just review their ballot make sure that everything is fine get that ballot in uh, because we want to make sure that every valid vote is counted and uh, i only highlight valid because what we do see and i have seen this 
with some of our homeless voters is that you have voters who are not residents of the county. Um, I mean, we've had voters who were residents from a, from a different part of the state who came to a polling place in Indianapolis and they wanted to vote in person on election day. And we had, you, know, you can only vote at the uh, in your county. And that county was roughly two and a half to three hours away. And it was towards the end of election day. So, you know, them getting to their county was just not going to happen. That person did vote provisionally. Um, but unfortunately, that provisional ballot was not counted uh, because they were just they were not voting in their county. So I'll <clears throat> on a more positive note, right. I'll, I'll leave here by saying, you know, um, for our homeless voters, take advantage of absentee by mail or voting by mail. Uh, your state may not require you to have an ID to vote by mail, so take advantage of that. Um, if you want to vote in person, uh, you can just be sure to know whether your county requires you to vote at one location or if you can vote at any of the locations in your county. All right, well, thank you very much, Russell, for, for all that uh, information. And we're going to jump right into Ira. He's going to talk about Big Law and the project that we're working on currently with Goodwin. Carlton, thank you very much. And um, is the screen being shared yet? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. And um, Russell, I've got to say, I really want to thank you for that inside view. Um, it's probably among the most informative presentations I've heard on what's actually happening in the field in connection with the election and the voting process. I, I really thank you so much for that. Um, you know, because what we do and what we've done, and I'll talk about the project we've been privileged to work with, is we're looking at pieces of paper. Maybe we're making a phone call, but just hearing what's actually happening on the ground just is, is, brings a whole new perspective to it. I really want to thank you for that. Um, you know, so Carl, to jump in, you know, thank you all very much. It's really been a privilege and an honor for our firm to be able to partner um, with your organization, the various other organizations, in connection with providing resources to people on the ground and various groups in connection with the upcoming election. And so what I want to talk about in a couple of minutes are, and normally I'm not someone who, when I do a presentation, goes into data and process. Um, but I think it's a little bit interesting here to get a flavor of what was involved in reaching the point we're at and then talk a little bit about the work product that we were able to generate in support of the efforts that you all are undertaking. So the project in partnership with the organization really had two deliverables. One was the creation of the voting right cards, which I'll talk about, and the other was an update on homeless voter registration requirements and basically a matrix and it's been published by various organizations and i'll talk about the various details um, but it it was a significant project um, we were looking to do it for all 50 states in the district of columbia and we had some incredible pre-existing work product but as we've all learned information gets dated on a fairly quick basis and in order to be valuable, the data that we provide to prospective voters, to organizations who are, who are promoting voting drives, and to the individuals who are looking to vote has to be current, up-to-date, and accurate. I think among one of the biggest lessons that I've learned during the project and I've drawn from the conversation all of you have had today is that this is a shockingly complicated process and these deadlines matter and missing a deadline, not having correct signatures, not having the requisite appropriate identification, not be able to identify in certain states where your mail could be delivered can result in your being disenfranchised and your vote not counting. And it's so incredibly important that everyone who is eligible to vote be in a position to cast a vote. And when they cast the vote, that vote be a proper vote, um, or to use Russell's word, a valid vote, and then that vote be counted and counted towards the election. So as far as the voting right cards, we really divided them up into two sections. One is how to register, and the other is actually then how to vote. Because again, it's important that 
people understand whether they're people experiencing homelessness, people coming into the voting system because of age or because of citizenship, that it's a two-part process that is spread out by time. There are some states in which you can register the day of election, not every state. And, you know, it's this jumble of 50 different sets of rules, regulations, websites um, that give rise to a lot of this confusion. So people need to understand you have to register to vote. And this is what we try to communicate in the cards, what it takes to register to vote, timelines, deadlines and the like, and then actually how to cast that vote once you have registered. So what we did was, and I'll talk about the group in a second, um, we used a large number of resources available to us. We went into the state statutes. We looked at cases that may have interpreted the state statutes. As a backup, we called the Office of the Secretary of State, for all I know someone spoke to you, Russell, um, in order to validate and verify the information. And interestingly, what we found in a number of states is that the information told to us about certain critical deadlines during our phone calls did not match what was published on the website. And so we were very careful about that. For example, we took a very conservative approach. If someone from the Secretary of State's office said, no, the application for a ballot needs to be received by October 23rd, and the website said it had to be received by October 18th, we reconciled that in favor of what was published on the website Again, because these deadlines are so absolutely critical and you don't want to have to litigate, you don't want to have to fight over a single ballot when you could take the conservative approach. But again, it was interesting to us that a lot of the information, at least in some instances, didn't really mesh. We also presented various website resources. Again, there's no uniformity across the method of presentation. There's no uniformity where if you go to Secretary of State of, you know, of Hawaii and Alaska and New York, you're looking at the same information in the same places, formatted and presented in the same way, even if the specifics differ. So it's really a hodgepodge of information. Um, you know, one of the fortunate things is many of the state's websites are SOS, Secretary of State at the state's name, .gov. So that is one helpful. Um, aspect of it. We looked at various methods of registration and we laid out in detail and with links to the relevant websites what it takes to register in person, what it takes to register online if available, and what it takes to register by mail. Uh, we talked about the registration deadlines and extremely important we talked about the ID requirements because as we know many of our fellow citizens facing homelessness or experiencing homelessness they don't have a driver's license. They don't have a social security card. As uh, Mr. Davis mentioned at the beginning, I believe it was Mr. Davis mentioned at the beginning or um, it may be one of the presenters, you know, your belongings may have been stolen from you and you no longer have available and, rec and relevant ID and necessary ID. So understanding those ID requirements were extremely important and we covered those in these cards. We then talked about how to vote. Um, as was mentioned, criminal voting and criminal record issues are extremely important, inconsistent from state to state. As noted before, in some jurisdictions, you can vote while incarcerated. You have to go through the warden. In some jurisdictions, you cannot vote until you have, in fact, been pardoned for certain crimes. In other states, upon release, you could vote. There is no consistency across states to state. Um, and there's an inconsistent application of the rules regarding voting with a criminal record or while currently incarcerated or under supervised release. Uh, we talked about the methods of voting, and I think one of the things, and I, you know, I don't blame the media, but I think the media has contributed to it, is the confusion between what is absentee voting and what is in mail voting, by mail voting. Are they the same thing? Do they overlap? Are they completely different? Again, we talked earlier about some of the information confusion that in the marketplace of ideas around voting, and there's just an enormous amount of confusion. Again, you could parse it through with the websites, but what's the difference between voting by mail and absentee voting? Um, whether you're talking about uh, members of the armed services serving abroad, or you're talking about college students who are resident in one state versus another, versus what we're all learning to be absentee voting which is taking hold in many states. 
We followed it up with specific information about ballot requests and by mail deadlines. Again, these deadlines are absolutely critical. If you have health concerns and you know now that you're not going to be voting in person, whether it's during early voting or on election day, if you do not request your ballot by the relevant deadline, you will have a choice either of voting in person or not voting at all. These deadlines are not extendable. And again, with the US Postal System and whatever is or is not happening with the US Postal Service system at this moment in time, you cannot count on timely receipt, you cannot count on timely delivery, and you need to be sensitive to, don't wait for the deadlines, as Russell said. Get out there, request them early, send them back early. Um, so again, we talk about early voting as well as ID requirements. And you know, one of the things that people should note is that what we have generally found, not universally, but generally found, is where you need an ID absolute to register. You generally, in many states, do not actually need that ID to vote on the day of voting. And understanding the provisional ballot issue is an incredibly important situation in many, many, many jurisdictions in order to preserve, in order to preserve your rights. The next thing we looked at was the homeless voter matrix. And for the purposes of the homeless population, this is equally important, if not more important to the voter information, voter registration, um, voting rights cards. Because what this is, is a, it's a simple single one page or actually two page spreadsheet, which talks about some critical information and looking at it, it also shows, as we'll talk about in a minute, the inconsistently across the 51 relevant jurisdictions of the laws, rules, regulations. So threshold question that we present on the matrix, can sheltered residents register to vote? And then by contrast, can unsheltered residents register to vote? What are the requirements around a mailing address, as noted earlier? In some states, you can draw a map. In some states you, can, states, you can identify where you are present while homeless. And again, one of the critical issues there, as you know, we've heard about some invalid ballots, even if homeless, you are a resident of the jurisdiction or the voting district in which you have registered. And so it's critical that that be properly identified so that when you either do appear to vote or when you send in your ballot, it matches where you have, where you reside matches where you have registered to vote. Um, we looked at the issue of whether or not the states, and very few do, have written policies specifically drawn to the issue of voting rights for homeless populations. We also looked at whether or not they have a statute that governs the rights of homeless to vote, and it's well less than a majority that's a minority of states that do. And that's obviously an issue that needs more um, looking at on a going forward basis, whether it's a lawyer's committee, whether it's our organization or others. And then finally, we looked at the nature of the ID requirements for voting. So what did it take to get this done? Um, it took a team of more than 25 lawyers, ultimately by the time we're done, putting in somewhere between three and 400 hours, um, covering virtually all of our offices, and two to, including we had the participation of two of our colleagues who are resident in our London office. And I have to say, you know, this particular project, other, other projects we've been privileged to partner, for example, with the Lawyers Committee, the voting rights projects in this current environment are getting overwhelming support across our law firm, and I suspect across all other law firms that are partnering with such organizations on a pro bono basis. This is viewed by many as a core issue of our time. And in light of recent passing of Justice Ginsburg, I think it's taken on for many people an elevated importance. And I think that there's an enormous resource available to the organizations to recruit lawyers from the law firms across the country, and as we've seen across the world, in order to support these efforts. And I will say, I've had no experience with voting rights prior to getting involved in helping to supervise this project, along with, and I'd be very remiss without calling out two of my colleagues, Peter Levin, who really took the day-to-day -day lead on this, one of the senior partners in my firm, as well as my partner, Neil Chatterjee. Um, and you know they put in countless hours supervising, and actually, as myself, did getting down in the weeds on a state-by-state -state basis. We also had lawyers, as you could see, drawn from a wide variety of practices. And as I noted, it was a 
it was a significant effort by the time we are done, which is noted earlier, we're not quite 100% done yet, but we are getting very close to being there. Um, finally, it was also a good opportunity, and this is something to keep in mind, um, Bloomberg, Bloomberg News, they partnered with us and we had a number of members of their in-house legal team who were extraordinarily generous with their time and resources. And again, for other law firm lawyers, solo practitioners who may be on the call, um, it's a great opportunity to work with your business clients, to work with your clients um, in order to get them involved. Because again, everyone you speak to, it, this becomes a passion project and this has become a passion project for everyone. Um, I know Carl, we're low on time. Um, I could call it here. I know we've got about two or three minutes left. Um, or I could sum up some of the findings, but again, I think I've covered them during the course of the presentation. Uh, no, your, your instincts are correct. I think uh, if you, uh, what we will uh, do, I know we have two minutes and there was a couple of questions that the audience uh, got to. And first of all, thank you for Ira for, sh for sharing, uh, sharing that information. Uh, the, the findings, uh, uh, we will have those photo cards available uh, soon for the people in the audience to uh, be able to see. Uh, they will be uh, on the coalition website, it'll be on our website uh, at the uh, National uh, Law, uh, Homelessness Law Center. Uh, and we will uh, uh, make sure that uh, we also figure out a mechanism so that Ira can share uh, our fi the findings and what they were able to discover. Um, so, one of the, one of the big questions is for Natasha, uh, uh, Megan, or Russell. Like, let's say if someone's evicted between, say, November first and uh, you know, time to vote, and they have to move somewhere to a different pre precinct. Do they have to re-register? And if so, where? Um, what What do you think for voters in that situation? So they get evicted between, you know, November first. Do they have to re-register? Um. I can give a quick answer to that. So uh, it generally depends on the time in which you're moving and where you're moving. So in most jurisdictions, if you're moving within 30 days and kind of within the same precinct, you don't necessarily have to update. Um, but if you, if it's outside 30 days, if you're moving to a different precinct, then you should. But the general rule of thumb is always, always, always just make sure you have your most current address because um, as other folks have mentioned, poll workers are kind of educated in various different ways. So you want to make sure that you're giving yourself the best chance of success when you either request your absentee ballot or go to the polls. Um, and the second piece that I'll mention is that really check the deadlines for your specific state and jurisdiction for registration. Um, so some states allow same day registration. For example, Minnesota allows you to register election day itself. Um, so you can correct any misinformation there but other states don't allow that. So just make sure that you're really checking up on the deadlines and the laws for your specific state. And try to keep your registration as current as you possibly can. Uh, another important question that we have before we wrap up is how can a fellow homeless uh, or former homeless folks who are conducting outreach best assist in voter registration, uh, early voting and voting by mail? This can be for Megan or whoever wants to answer. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll go. I'll just, oh, oh, go, James. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say something real quick. But I think that our panelists, our esteemed panel, didn't quite cover um, so much with transportation issues. Um, I know we focus a lot on absentee and um, mail-in voting, but transportation is an issue, especially during this COVID time, especially for homeless folks with public transportation. So we're doing in our my community is we're going out talking to people who have the um, the funding and the um, necessities of providing people with um, car riding services like Lyft and Uber to get them to the polls, especially the elderly folks who might not be wanting to get on public transportation because of the COVID situation. So I just wanted to chime in with that real quick. Thank you. Thanks for having me on this panel. Thank you. All right, Megan, were you going to say something, and then you'll be the you'll be the last okay. person well, to ask um, question. Okay. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. So, um, oh, yeah. 
we've we've heard from a lot of uh, a lot of outreach workers. So here's the thing. Um, I you know I kind of mentioned before, but there luckily there's there's a lot of assistance out there right now for for voters um, for folks who are trying to assist voters. Um, the one eight eight six six our vote um, the lawyers committee work um, is, is something that we've referred people to for for years. It's um, their their resources are, are really excellent. I think um, because we have most of us have smartphones. You know if you are doing outreach, you could. Um, in 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 many states, not in all states, but in many states, you could register someone using your smartphone when you're out with them. Uh, you know, so so think about that. Again, really, the first step is knowing what your regulations are. It's been said, knowing what your deadlines are, um, and you know, even to the the previous question, you know, we know that um, there are going to be people who, um, even with all of this information we're trying to get out there, will still struggle. Uh, to cast their ballots, to make sure that they're registered on time. Uh, we know that there are going to be people, we're, we're staring down a tidal wave of evictions. Um, even with the CDC moratorium that was um, extended, there's there's many, many evictions being processed, being submitted out there. So um, we know that people will be losing their housing, um, and, and it could be the day before the, the um, election, um, but again, like, you know, if you don't have the same day registration and you move, you know, a week before the election, but the deadline is two weeks before the election, what do you do? We, we know that there's going to be people who are kind of left behind. That's where uh, the lawyers committee comes in. That's where, um, you know, others who are kind of monitoring the elections come in. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, what, what we're really trying to do, I think collectively, all of these um, fantastic panelists, you know, we're all trying to make sure that we get out to outreach workers and to other service agencies and to homeless folks and formerly homeless folks um, and this information and just really encourage them, uh, you know, that, that your vote really, really matters, especially because so many programs um, that are governed by our elected officials really affect our, our daily lives uh, and, and that's why it's it's not just for political reasons it's not for our own gain it's really because um, you're electing people that uh, that will make decisions that will affect your life all right well, thank you very much for for sharing that and as you've heard today um, you know make sure that people uh, don't allow not having a home be a barrier to be a barrier to vote. We, you have uh, contact information for all the panelists. Uh, if you do have any additional questions that were not answered today, uh, my information is going to be on the last slide. Can we get to the next slide, please, to the poll? We have a couple of poll questions for those that are still on the call. Um, as you see here, uh, will you uh, use uh, what you've learned today in advocacy on behalf of people experiencing homelessness during COVID-19 and beyond? Hopefully it's 100% yes. So you're not allowed to click no. And then for the second question, will you talk about the human right to housing in your future advocacy again? We, uh, you're not allowed no questions. Can't, can't pick no. So I'll give you a few moments and, and, and again, thank you for uh, being with us over time. Uh, and lastly, uh, as we've uh, discussed today, I mean, just like voting is a right, you no know, housing is, is public health and it's a human right. Uh, we have our information here that if you support you know, our cause, uh, no matter how large or small, it helps us to uh, aid our valuable neighbors across the country. Uh, that's nlchp.org slash backslash donate. Also, once this video is posted, please share it with your networks on all social media platforms, uh, listservs, et cetera. If you have questions or somebody has questions, just roll this tape, roll this footage. There was so much valuable information that was shared, and I'm sure that they will uh, have a, uh, be well educated about their right to vote after watching it. My contact information is here, and I want to thank you all, and I hope you have a great week. Take care. Thank you, you as well. Thanks, everyone.